The Drum Candy Podcast is brought to you by Drum Factory Direct. What's up, everyone? Welcome into episode 52 of the Drum Candy Podcast. This is your host, Mike Dawson, coming to you from Drum Factor Direct in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This week's guest is a great drummer, producer, mix engineer, and studio owner, Jim Eno of the band Spoon. Spoon is currently touring in support of their 10th studio record, Lucifer on the Sofa, and they're on a short two-week break, so we were able to catch up with Jim in between legs of the tour to talk about production and, and how he works with other drummers and how he develops his own parts and performing this stuff live. Really, really fun conversation. I learned a lot in this one. Also, uh, Jim is involved in Project Traction, where he mentors women and non-binary musicians to help them become producers, which is super cool. So make sure you follow that, Project Traction, on social media. And also follow Jim Eno Acid on Instagram. See what he's up to. Make sure you check out the Spoon record and all the records. It's some really, really cool production and great songs. So let's get to it. Jim Eno of Spoon. Uh, well, let's start with, you're on like a two-week break from tour, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. What do you do with that little bit of window between runs? Do you book it or do you just take time to rest? <laughs> uh, well, I was supposed to have three weeks off, but we had to postpone some shows and move them to the end of the tour. So, um, yes, yeah, so my three week got cut down to two weeks. So I had stuff I had to do uh production and recording wise in those three weeks so i'm actually like cramming them all in right now so (laughs) So does that mean touring is more of a vacation for you or is it it Uh, i mean i don't know it was uh, i mean yeah touring is like a vacation where sometimes uh you can't get any sleep you know like we had a lot of we had a couple of bad runs where you know, every, our bus was like shaking, you know, and you had to sleep anyway and a bunch of runs, a bunch of shows in a row. So, you know, there was a lot of sleep deprivation on this last tour. Mm. Now, did you guys do any touring over the past year? No, I think the last time, well, yeah, I mean, uh, let's see, I think we did a, a little bit at the end of last year, I think. Okay. Oh, in February, we did some, yeah, but um, very, very, very little. The last big tour we did was, I guess, 2019 with uh, Beck and Cage the Elephant. Right. So did it feel weird getting back out there or does it feel like you're riding a bike? Uh, Parts of it is the old bike, but part of it is like, you know, changing, changing how we tour, you know, trying to keep like contact down with people. Um, you know, having to test and things get thrown up in the air if someone tests positive, you know, it's, it's a whole different world, you know, I mean, it it can really impact routing and shows and things like that. Um, We had two of us tested positive over this last run and had to postpone three shows. But during that time, I mean, I just remember hearing about like, you know, three to five other bands that had to sort of cancel shows and it's just happening, happening to everyone right now. Yeah. It's pretty wild. Were you, were yeah. you guys asymptomatic or were you actually ill? Uh, I was pretty asymptomatic. Um, our guitar player uh, had, had some symptoms and we both had, uh, we're both double boosted. Mm. So since I tour so much, you know, I actually went ahead and got my second booster I got vaccinated also very, very early. So it had been uh, six months since my booster. So I wanted to get it before I went out again and, you know, still got it, but my symptoms were definitely very mild, like a, like a cold, you know? Mm -hmm. So did you guys do a bunch of rehearsals before this run to get, get your, your road chops back? We did. Yeah. We did about a week of rehearsals. You know, uh, one of the things about uh, this record is we recorded a lot of it as a band sort of live working up what we were going to play together. Mm -hmm. So it's probably the record that came together for touring the quickest that we've had in a very long time. Mm -hmm. Um, Most of the time we're adding a lot of like parts and keyboards and things like that. Then we have to like prioritize like what parts we want the guys to play. 
you know, so, uh, and who's going to play this part? How are we going to do that? Uh, mm -hmm. it, it was a lot less of that on this record, which was pretty cool. So do you, um, um, like the set list choice where you have a new record out, do you, you mm -hmm. play the whole record and then add pick and choose, or do you have like one set list that goes for the whole tour? You know? We do. Yeah, we have, we have like a lot of, we'll play like maybe four or five per night pretty con mm -hmm. consistently and then sprinkle in some of the other songs. Um, you know, the, like a song like Astral Jacket, you know, we haven't, I don't think we've played that live yet. We're ready to play it. It's just, we haven't found a right uh, a, a time or the, the right place in the set list yet, I think. Mm. So, um, so who makes the decision? Is it like game time set list decision or you plan it out early? No, it's a, uh, uh, Britt does the set list. Sometimes he'll be like, can someone else do the set list? And one of us will do it, but uh, he'll usually do it. And we usually get it about an hour before the show, maybe two hours before the show. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are like blocks of songs that work well together that we have transitions planned out. So yeah. a lot of times those blocks will be similar. Maybe a song or two will swap out. Um, it's something we started doing a couple records ago where we like really worked on transitions between songs. And I think it, it's, it's pretty fun. You know, um, you know, a lot of times I'll have to go from, you know, a tempo, like, I don't know, like small stakes is about like over 160. And I'll have to go to like, don't you ever, which is like around 121, like instantly, you know, da 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 boom da ba boom boom you know so there's like a lot of things where like i'll see it two hours before and i'm like yeah i don't know okay yeah i'll try that let's see if i can do that you know so. that happened to me on a gig recently when i couldn't get the tempo for the second song i was just too fast oh yeah what is your do you have any like are you thinking they're in the last repeat like eight bars like preparing to downshift or I mean, how did yeah. you get the muscle memory? No, no, I, I, I sort of like uh, during the last few bars, I, I think what I'm doing is I'm like subconsciously like humming the bass line or whatever it needs to be. Mm. Um, and then what I'll also what I'll usually do is play it slower than I think it is. Mm -hmm. If I'm going from a faster to a slower song because it always is slower than I think, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'll like, be like, okay, I'm going to drag this shit back. And then, you know, usually I'll, it will be about there. Um, <clears throat> the other thing I'll do is I have a Tama rhythm watch and I've mm -hmm. used this for probably 15 years or maybe longer where I will program in the starting tempos of songs. Um, and I can, I can just click through set list is different every night. So I do it every time before the show, but I can, uh, I'll kick off a song and I'll maybe hear the rhythm watch. Uh, so I know I'm kicking it off at the same, at the right tempo every night mm -hmm. from there, it can move around. So sometimes if I like, there's no gap and I haven't been able to listen to the tempo sometimes like as I'm playing, I'll just click it. And like, I can hear, oh. the, hear the tempo and I'll be like, yeah, I'm pretty close or whatever. Or, you know, I, I usually don't worry too much about it um, unless the whole band is like looking at me, you know, like, <laughs> what are you doing? That actually happened the other day. Uh, I, for some reason I get, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the record, but The Devil and Mr. Jones and On the Radio, I get those two songs mixed up when i see them on the set list sometimes mm -hmm. okay so we were like on the radio okay let's go and i kicked off the tempo and the beat of devil and mr jones <laughs> where um the drums don't even come in on on the radio until like you know 20 seconds in and the whole band is like looking back at me but no one really knew what was wrong that was the funny thing <laughs> and then i instantly i'm like Oh, I am on the wrong song, you know? And Benny, our bass player, he's like, he's doing this motion is like, don't worry, dude, keep playing. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. Cause I was just like, 
oh shit. You know, and the, you know, one of those rules is you never stop, you know, but I was like questioning because it was such a chaotic moment. It was just very warming, warm and comforting. Just, just see Benny, like, just like, you're good, dude. Just keep going. We'll get it. So, oh, shoot. Does that stuff bother you after the show or do you just forget about it? It really, it was bothering me. Yeah. Um, and I, I can, I can like get in my head, but you know, I've been doing this for, you know, 30 years and I know that it's always so much worse than I think it is. I mean, I'm sorry. I think it's so much worse than it actually is. No yeah. one would notice. So, th- so there's some version out there that is on the radio with drum intro of, you know, devil and Mr. Jones for 20 <laughs> seconds. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and like after the guys were like, yeah, so was the tempo slower? I'm like, yeah, the tempo was slower. And I was playing the wrong beat. And they're like, oh, you were playing the wrong beat too? You know, so it, was, it wasn't as bad as I, as I thought. You know? uh, yeah, yeah. That's pretty funny. So are you guys, you had discussions about to make this song a little bit faster. Like this is something I debate with bandmates all the time. I prefer mm-hmm. to always play stuff to the record. And then I always get, well, no, let's kick it up a few for the live show. Yep. You, uh, do you guys do that? Yeah, we always kick it up a little bit. Yeah. Okay. Yep. And what and is I'm how usually, far up? Yeah, I'm usually, I, it, all, it all depends, you know. I mean, I'm the one kicking off the tempo. And, you know, plus if I'm not playing a song to a click, if one of the guys is like, okay, let's take it up 1 dB. You know, like, I mean... I can't do that. <laughs> right. you know, I do. I do drums for a living, but I'm not gonna like. I'll kick it off one fat, or you know, one BPM faster. But I mean, I'm not good enough to be able to be one BPM for a three minute song the whole time. You know, so yeah, yeah. I'll be like, okay, guys, you know, you understand. There's it's <laughs> fuzzy after we start, <laughs> right? You know? um, but uh, you know, we'll definitely like um, and. It's weird. I, I will usually start all our rehearsals on a new song or a new record playing to a click, unless it's like a basher, like a crazy kind of thing, just to try to get everyone used to the tempo. And I like really try to hold it down. <clears throat> but I can tell certain songs are like, we need it a little faster. You know, we just need it like a little bit more up, you know. I, I And then I'll go and listen to YouTube and it's like, man, we're playing all our songs a little faster and I'll start getting in my head about it, but I'll, I'll just, I'll try to I'll try to be good with it. You know? Yeah. What is your, um, what is your live rig? What's your kit? Uh, I use CNC. So yeah. I have a CNC kit. I have a, I trigger one sample, the intro of inside out. So that goes into like a little SPD kind of thing. I have a mixer to my left. Uh, which mixes um, my Tama Rhythm Watch with um, the sample <clears throat> because the sample has like a a drum beat in it that I sort of have to match the tempo of when it drops out so I can control how loud that is. And then I also have an Omni mic behind me mm. to give a little uh, room if I want it, So, mm-hmm. which is sort of fun. You know, I use in-ears. I don't have a, I, we don't have audience mics or anything. So, um, so I, I tend to put that up if I need a little, I need a little like hype, you know. Mm-hmm. Is the, are the guitars using amps or is everyone going like mod, modelers? What they call modelers now? Yeah, no, every, everything amps? is, we don't play to tracks. Uh, we don't use any modeling or anything. Yeah, it's all old school. Okay. Amps. So you're hearing yeah. some amps on stage. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Those guys use monitors. I'm the only one that uses in ears. So there's a lot of sound on stage. Um, yeah. Oh, the other, I use Istanbul symbols. I love them. I've been using them forever. Uh, I use the traditional line and then mm. um, medium traditionals and then uh, Vic Firth sticks. Has your live kit changed or has it been pretty consistent? It's been pretty consistent. I just do a, um, um, you know, I don't know the depths, but I use, uh, um, you know, 
14 by five and a half snare, mm -hmm. but then I have a 12 inch rack Tom and I think it's maybe using a 15 inch. No, I think it's a 16 inch floor Tom mm -hmm. and the CNC floor Toms tend to be like, uh, they do a sort of smaller depth and they're really, really nice. I use them a lot for recording too. Now that's my next question. Is that the same kit you would track with? No, I have a, I mean, I use that floor tom probably on every song on the record. Um, but I also have a, uh, a, like a 62 Ludwig kit and a 62 Rogers kit at my studio that we'll use also. And then our snares will always just switch it up. How do you settle on the snare drum? Uh, let's see. I don't know. I mean, I'm not like a master at tuning and I have this weird thing where like, I'll be like, let me try this drum and I'll bring it down. I'll play it a little bit and then we'll mic it. And I'll know pretty instantly whether it's going to work for the song, mm -hmm. but also like maybe it's my drum closet or something. There's sometimes I'll pull a snare out that I haven't used in years and that has never worked on a song. And it's like, it's this guy's magic day, you know, and he like <laughs> sounds so amazing. And it's like, okay, cool. I get to use this guy today, you know? But, uh, so it's, it's a lot of random. Like if I want a brighter type of sa sound, I'll use a metal snare. If I want something a little warmer, I'll, I'll try a wood one, but you know, all bets are off based on how it's sounding once you mic it. Mm -hmm. So do you, I assume you put your producer hat on when you're choosing drums. Is it, is, what do you list? Like what, what makes it sound good or not? Is it how it's fitting frequency wise or is it duration amplitude? Yeah, it, like what are you listening for? It's, it's all of those. I'm not really listening to amplitude. I'm listening to duration and I tend to like really dry snares. Mm -hmm. So I'll use a lot of moon gels and things like that. Um, but really it's just like having a, uh, sharp, snappy tone without a lot of like a, a thud or, or a low end tubbiness. Because mm -hmm. I feel like that sort of weighs a drum kit down when you have like a sort of slow tubby response from a snare drum. Mm -hmm. Now, when I'm producing, there are a lot of tracks that I do that are slower tempos that you can get away with that. So I'll maybe push that way. Um, but I feel like with spoon, we like uh, dry snappy snares and not a lot of room mics, you know, mm -hmm. and a little bit of like sort of distortion. It's been pretty standard for a while. What we, what we tend to like. Mm -hmm. Now has your process for tracking drums, changed or evolved over the years or are you always experimenting or is it more systematic at this point yeah we're always experimenting with different things like <clears throat> we, we've done the you know fleetwood mac double drum thing quite a bit um but on this record i uh, had the idea that we would uh sort of take that a step further where we would um have two band takes where we would mm. pan one left and one right so the first song on the record is a song called Held. And there are two, one take of uh, guitar and drums on the left and one take, a different take of guitar and drums on the right. And then we had, we picked one bass take up the middle because of phasing and things like that. We wanted to keep things a little bit more controlled. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, and it ended up working out really, really well. Um, so that was the first time we tried that, but we're always looking for different ways to do things. And then on um, uh, the hardest cut, uh, the guys always, every record they want me to record like the Queens of the Stone Age, where uh, it's symbols overdubbed, you know, and, you know, so I always have to try it. And uh, so we tried it for hardest cut, which was originally it was like, riding on a crash the whole time do dip where it would be like whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. so it's really bombastic and so with mark rankin he's done this a lot more than i have so the way he does it is he will uh 
tape up all the symbols, but leave the symbols there. So use like packing blankets and things like that. So you play the part exactly the same both times. So you get the physical reaction of hitting the symbols. You just don't hear them. And it mm -hmm. tends to be a lot stronger way to, to do a, um, a non-symbol and a symbol only take, you know? Mm -hmm. Song with, um, you know, all the symbols taped up. Uh, and then, you know, obviously the reason you do this is so that the drums can be like big and roomy and punchy and you don't have like symbols in this upper frequency range that can be very, very harsh cutting through everything. So that's one of the reasons why, you know, you have to tame the room mics a lot if you have symbols in them to, to get a, it's sort of an art to try to get a <clears throat> big drum sound uh, with tame symbols, you know. Mm -hmm. If you record them separately, you know, you can get really big drums, but then your cymbals are on separate faders, so you don't really have to worry about it. So uh, then I recorded all the cymbals doing exact, exactly the same performance. And we were working on the song for a while like that, and the drums were coming out to my console with like two faders, and the cymbals were coming out to two faders. And one day we pull it up, pull up the track, going from one song to the other, you have to reset the monitor section to get the balances all right. And we're listening and we're like, oh man, the song sounds like a lot bigger and like way more open than we remember it. Like what's going on? And Mark's like, producer's like, oh, I forgot to put the symbols in. And I'm like, oh shit. Because I knew <laughs> as soon as, as soon as he put the symbols in, I knew that they it was better without them. So then I did the, all, this whole process of recording the drums with the symbols, and there are basically no symbols on that song, you know. So weird, <laughs> super weird. Yeah. So uh, are you, you know, as you're writing the songs, do your parts get kind of solidified to where that doesn't freak you out? Does that have to play them perfectly two different times, you know? Oh, well, I, don't, I haven't really done that before, but my, yeah, my parts are pretty, you know, when I write parts, I tend to do like sort of uh, themes, especially on the fills where I'm like, I like this fill and I'll like sort of evolve it as the song goes along. Mm -hmm. um, I'll have like, you know, verse parts, chorus parts. We'll work on that a lot. Talk about how, open hi-hats work, symbols, things like that. So I'll have, I'll have things pretty, pretty dialed in. And <clears throat> I like to get it to a point where I know my part pretty well so that um, I feel like there's, there's a point where you get to when you're uh, learning pretty much any part uh, where you're in a chorus and you don't have to think about whether you're going into like the second verse or the bridge. You know, you're, you're just out of that. You know the song so well and you know your part so well. You get out of the, like, what is my next thing head uh, in your head. Uh, and then you play a lot freer and you're more, uh, you know, basically more musical. So. Is the, when you say no symbols, was the hi-hat muted up no. too? Or you? Yeah, the hi-hat was, Yeah. So you had no symbol, no ride, no, no, yeah. no hi hats. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So listen to it. There, we did end up overdubbing a hi hat, you know, and I, I can't remember if we overdubbed a crash to put in there or used one of the crashes. I think we would have had to overdub a crash because uh, the quote symbol track, I was crashing on it, but then I went right over to that, you know, white noise riding the crash mm -hmm. thing. So, um, but all that was done after as sort of accents, like what does the song need, you know? And so when you, I noticed with a couple of spots, you overdubbed Tom Bill. Is that yep. done for the same idea or is there another kind of concept for that? That's more done. Um, yeah, you're probably thinking of either um, Devil, Devil and Mr. Jones or on the radio. That's done more, I think, for excitement and movement, you know, mm. because... Uh, 
you know, kick, snare, and hat if there's no bass. You know, sometimes we want to have a little bit more movement, and so you add a little a little part there. Did that happen? Like, what part part of the stage? When do you make those decisions? Like, do you do a take where you just perform it, and then you start pulling yeah. it apart? Okay. Yeah, no, I would, I would, I would perform it. And then, you know, there's a lot of discussion and this is like, I mean, this isn't rocket science. This is how all recording and production works, but we just talk about like what is needed on the song, you know? And if, if someone is like, oh, the, the verse isn't working, you know, they may not be able to uh, articulate what's wrong with the verse, but we have to sort of figure out what's wrong with it, you know? So then you, you ask questions of like, is it rhythmic? Is it, you know, um, too much space, not enough space? Is it, uh, you know, um, melodic? Is it, do we need chords? Do we need pads? You know, uh, you know, so what is needed to help? So then we'll just go start trying things and mm -hmm. discussing what we think is a good idea or not. Maybe pull up a reference of a track that, is like, man, I was driving around listening to the radio and I heard this track, maybe this verse idea could work, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Do you ever take a song like fully produced and then say, all right, let's do a totally different version of it now? Like that isn't quite right. Or is it happen sooner? Yeah. In the process? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like with, I think satellite on this record was the third time we've recorded it. Hmm. And you know, I'm not even sure what was not working on the other versions. It, it, we just knew it wasn't good enough. You know, mm. I feel like maybe this time we sort of cracked the code on the intro to where the drums came in. Maybe um, I feel like that was always something that we were trying to figure out how to make unique and how to make cool and how to draw people in. So maybe maybe that was it. Mm. Now, is it a thing where if any one person in the band is, is questioning something, you have to stop and figure it out? Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah, like it's very collaborative and very, you know, you know, um, we take everyone's input, you know. I mean, uh, I do feel like Britt being the songwriter, he's the guy that's going to be driving a lot of that stuff, you know, because he mm -hmm. in his head knows how he wants to present the song. But, you know, we've all, you know, uh, basically red flagged certain sections like, man, we really need something here. It's like, OK, mm -hmm. let's work on that, you know. Now, are you presented with fully like produced demos or how does it get from idea to final product? Uh, a lot of different ways. Um, so I may hear a final demo and then we will just like sort of work on how as a band we're going to approach it using that as like a maybe more of a stricter guideline you know mm -hmm. um but then there's other times when i don't even hear a demo and Britt will be like hey i have this riff you know let's let's play around with this and as a band we'll sort of play around with it even though there is a demo he sort of just wants to get our ideas fresh without mm -hmm. getting clouded by a demo you know um yeah, I think there's something to be said for that because like um, for drum parts, if I hear demo drums, it's hard to pull myself away sometimes. So a lot of times I like to hear just really, really simple drum parts and then I can like, or or just a click or nothing. And mm -hmm. sometimes I'll come up with, with stuff that is a little bit out of the ordinary that way. Do you take a... Um keep it simple approach at first or do you try to throw everything at it and then pull back? I don't know. Um, I think for me, knowing my drumming style, even like throwing the kitchen sink at a song, most drummers would hear that as very stripped down. <laughs> but to okay. me, it sounds like, to me, it probably sounds like too busy. You know, <laughs> so I probably feel like it's, like I throw a lot of things at it, um, but I usually end up stripping it all back. And then for you, an embellishment would mean what? Ghost notes, hi-hat opens, 
fills? Like, what would you go yeah, to? Yeah, I work on I work on a lot of like um, it's mostly fills. Trying to come up with like that hooky stylized fill, you know, mm-hmm. that will be like a thematic thing over the song. I sort of, you know, I don't know. I get into that. Mm-hmm. Um, how often are you working with other drummers in the studio? Well, I have a recording studio and I produce other records when I'm not touring and mm-hmm. working on Spoon stuff like all, so all the time. Are you often playing on them or, or bringing in other players? Uh, I love to bring in other players because then mm-hmm. I can, um, I don't beat myself up over the part <laughs> if I'm not playing it, you know? Right. I have a much clearer picture of the overall vision if I'm not playing drums. So mm-hmm. that being said, I'm, I'm doing this. Um, uh, it's a something I started called Project Traction. It's a uh, female production mentorship program where I've identified female musicians, female non-binary musicians who uh, I think uh, could move over into production. And then I'm co-producing a track with them and uh, picking a band working on it and then I'm mixing it. So sort of mentoring uh, a musician to move over into production because the, the recording production fields are so male dominated. It's at like 5%, you know, women. Mm -hmm. So I'm working on that project anyway, and I'm doing a lot of things where I'm producing with these musicians, but working with bands and starting a lot with drum machines, but then I think I've played on an over 50% track just because, you know, I'm, I'm there and I'm like, okay, I've listened to the track, you know, for two days, I have a drum idea, you know, to mm-hmm. put down. So, um, so getting out of my comfort zone as far as playing on tracks I'm producing. That's super cool. So what does it, what does it mean to be a producer in, in your, your genre? Like what, what are all the roles you have to play? Um, I mean, I don't know. I record a lot of different type of genres. So I would just say I have a certain production style mm-hmm. and I feel like there's, I mean, there's a lot to it. I mean, if you look at just like the logistics part of it, there's like, you have to finish the project on time and um, be on budget, you know, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of, you know, scheduling and figuring out who's going to play on it and all that kind of stuff. Um, Then if you start looking at the creative side of things, it's trying to have like a a vision of where the song should go. Um, And, you know, to to be honest, a lot of times I don't need, I don't necessarily have that from the beginning, but I tend to know how to direct it into a certain place, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so there's that. Uh, I mean, you know, there's there's things like what is the best part, you know? So when you're working with a musician, say you're working on, you know, verse two keyboard part, uh, no one knows what it's going to be. So you do, maybe what you do is you define an initial direction or initial like overall idea on what needs to happen in the second verse. And then mm-hmm. you also have a sound in your head on what's going to work. Then you start having the musician play. And for me, I don't play keyboards. So what I will do is I will identify things that I like and that I think are going to work. And then we target those and then we build a part from there. And maybe Mm -hmm. I'm doing like effects too, to that part, generating some excitement kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So um, again, I'm just trying to free form on some roles of like production, you know? I do also think like I've talked to other, I've had some like production meetings and I feel like uh, a a lot of producers feel that like the role is to get like the best performance out of people. And I would say, yes, I totally agree with that. And I feel like that is a um, very, very important part of production. But to me, the thing that, uh, I feel is more important than that is to keep the listener's interest. I feel like as a producer, you don't have um, uh, the luxury of your listener being in a club 
drinking, seeing all these people jumping up and down and having four walls that's redirecting the sound all over the place. There's an excitement about seeing a live show that you don't get that when you are listening to earbuds and and listening to a track, you know, on uh, your computer or on the radio. So for me, you know, we have to generate interest uh, within just these earbuds for people to to listen. And I, I take a lot of time and I think there's a lot of really cool things you can do uh, with staging and noises and sounds and things like that so that the listener is excited as the song goes along. So I feel like that is a lot of the type of production that I do and that I really love is to generate excitement and, and, and um, interest and generating surprises too, uh, mm-hmm. to, to basically keep people's interest. Is that done mostly with parts or with like mixing tricks and things like that? Um, mostly by parts, I think, but I do a lot of mixing tricks too. Um, I, when I'm producing a song, I tend to n- like not like to leave things to mixing. Mm. I, I hate to be with a band and be like, yeah, that, 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 you know, we need something leading into that last chorus. And I, I hate saying, okay, well, let's, we'll do that in the mix, you know, mm-hmm. because, because I would love the artist to be super psyched about that transition before I ever get into mixing, you know, mm-hmm. um, being a producer and being in the recording business is also like you're in the service industry. You know, my job is to make that band love what they did, you know, and be really excited about that track. So. I don't want to push something off until later. I want to, you know, commit to things and be happy with things. And then there are less surprises later on, you know, Mm -hmm. want the artist to be excited uh, in every part of the process. Mm -hmm. I talked to a video game music producer a while ago, and he mentioned every four bars, something has to happen. Are you that particular about it? To where it's like, if, if 10 seconds go by and nothing changes and we got to add something or take something away or do something. Yeah, no, I don't think about it that way. I think I'm, I'm more on the, um, uh, macro level, like, um, uh, something has to happen during the bridge. That's different that no one's ever heard before. Sort Mm -hmm. of like that, you know, Mm -hmm. um, or like I mentioned something, you know, I'm losing interest a little bit at the last half of the third verse, whatever, you know, that kind of thing. I'm more, okay. on, more on that level. I work with this band, Chick, 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 and they were funny because they would play music for people. And as soon as someone would pick up their phone while they were listening, they would be like, okay, yep, yeah, right there, we need something. <laughs> <laughs> I dig it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Does that, all that stuff transfer into when you play these songs live? Like the, all those little nuances. Uh, yeah, I think appears. that's I think that's a little bit different. You know, again, like I said, the live thing is, you know, there's a lot more things. There's lights. There's people. Mm. There's there are drinks. It, you know, there's the band jumping around. Um, so, um, but we do talk about like you know energy and how to generate energy and what's needed and stuff like. Um, um, like Lucifer on the sofa, like that song, I tracked it. I played hard, but it's a very linear song on the record. So live, I do play it a little more. Um, Hi hats opening a little bit more. My snare volume is down in certain parts, you know, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, just because we felt like it, uh, the linearness of the track doesn't translate as well live and we don't have like the saxophone and a lot of other things that we have the luxury of having uh, in the recorded version. Mm-hmm. All right. So if you're working with another drummer in your studio, do you have any pet peeves or, or things you wish drummers would stop doing when they're recording <laughs> or, or, or do you, You know, how do you work with another drummer, I guess, is the question. Do you have things you know you're going to have to ask them not to do or to do? 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, I tend to like very, very simple drumming. Um, but I feel like um, when I work with drummers, they like really respect that about my playing. Mm -hmm. So they usually take my suggestions, um, you know, and usually like them. It hasn't always been the case, but, mm. you know, some drummers tend to fill up space with ghost notes and with like uh, sort of, you know, displaced backbeats like do that, bat, do bat, you know, like that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I tend to like when maybe like other instruments are doing that, but the drummer just tends to like plow ahead, mm -hmm. you know? So I feel like with new bands and new drummers, sometimes uh, it, it may seem like it's tight to do that. But I tend like I, I I tend to sometimes feel like you lose the forward momentum uh, if you add add stuff like that, where sometimes it is just stronger and it has more impact if it's a do da, you know like just like that you know. Mm -hmm. um, I do feel like um, you know I did this with one band called I mean these guys were amazing they're called the Kickback from Chicago. And I made the suggestion that they would, if they would, um, cause we had like very limited time to track the whole band or to, to do the record. So I made the suggestion that they would do the songs from like start to finish with no vocals, you know, because I feel like then what that does is that frees up whoever is doing the vocals to be able to play better. And we can get, maybe we get a keeper guitar track, who knows, uh, and, uh, you know, that helped a lot, you know, um, because you don't want like the drummer to expect a vocal cue and then doesn't have it. And then, you know, sort of messes up, you know, um, what else? Uh, yeah, there are going to be certain things that like, uh, having the drummer know their current part really well and then being open for changes, I guess, is probably the biggest thing. You know, sometimes when you make a suggestion for anyone, not even drummers, it can throw them for a loop. But I try to like create a really like fun, uh, safe space in the studio where we're just trying things, everything's okay. And we're just going to keep moving until we get the best take. So try to take the pressure off because the pre there's a like can be intense pressure in the studio. And I've had that in recording drums before and it really sucks and it's really hard. So I try not to create that environment. Mm. Do you ever suggest bands not play to a click? Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what would be the deciding factor for that decision? Uh, um, let's see if they want to, <laughs> you know, yeah. and if, if they, uh, if they sound good without it, you know, I mean, I think one of the big things of the playing with a click to me is important if you're going to do uh, any sort of electronics along with the track. Um, mm -hmm. And it's also uh, important if you're going to like maybe sync up, uh, like sometimes what I'll do is like, you know, uh, have a 16th note click going that goes into a gate of like a low end synthesizer. And so the low end is just like, blah, 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 you know, like that. Oh, wild. Okay. You can't do stuff with like that if the band is free form or you mm. can, it just takes so much time, you know? So usually with more electronic type bands, I will be like, yeah, we probably should do a click in order to um, make things str straighter so we can like sync up to other devices, you know, mm. rock bands. I don't think it really matters that much. Uh, one thing that is beneficial of doing everything to a click is to be able to comp between drum takes, you know, using a chorus from this one and a verse from that one or whatever, if there's a mistake, just sort of 
in your playlists. Everything is all the same. So you lose that a little bit. But if you're, if, again, if you go to like the macro level, like, oh, we're speeding up too much. Let's go over to this take. You know, we can usually make that kind of stuff work. So as the, um, I, mean, I guess we're what twenty years into Pro Tools. What has the 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 editing capabilities of Pro Tools affected what you think a keeper take is? So, will you let more flubs go by knowing that it doesn't really matter versus energy? Or, or yeah, not? that's a good question because I feel like, uh, yeah, two things on that. We used to record to tape all the time. We only we do that sometimes still, but um, you know, our early records are all tape. And I remember like getting a take and then be like, man, this one little section, I don't know if it's good enough, you know? So we have conversations of like, well, do you think you can beat it? Because if I can't beat it, I'm erasing what I currently have. We don't have <laughs> enough tracks to actually do two takes and then comp. So I mean, it's incredibly stressful, you know, mm -hmm. and I even remember like there's, I mean, yeah, there's songs that I can hear little mistakes where we're just decided to, to leave it, you know, but I mean, we, you know, we knew that. So what we would do is on all of the overdubs, all the other guys had to match me, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So every other overdub would be like, okay, remember this, this little section is a little more on top. So everyone has to play a little more on top. And I would usually be like hyper-focused and make sure that the bass played a little on top and stuff like that. You know, now that I'm talking about it, I mean, I haven't done, had to do that for years, you know, mm -hmm. just because now you just nudge shit, you know? Right. But we used to be down to that detail where we would, everyone would have to be on the same page that, okay, there's a keeper one and we're, everyone's going to embrace this and be, you know, um, be into that, you know. Does that mentality still live on, even though you don't have to? Uh, it sort of does. But I mean, like, I don't really worry about like bass being ahead of the kick drum too much anymore. Like we'll get a keeper take. And then we'll do a couple listens and be like, okay, let's just nudge that guy and nudge that guy, you know, mm -hmm. um, a little side note, but sort of along the same storyline is I engineered a record that Tony Visconti produced and Tony Visconti did all the old, like uh, um, Bowie records and he did all the early T-Rex records. And so we were on a dinner break and I, I always had this theory that um, a lot of early production like cool ideas that we look at now were to cover up mistakes mm -hmm. that we couldn't fix because of tape, you know? So, and I asked him about this. He's like, oh, that's totally true. He's like, when I worked with Mark Bolin on T-Rex stuff, you know, Tony Visconti would be like, um, <clears throat> you know, well, this song, we just finished the, the rhythm section and you guys all slow down there. And Mark Bolin would be like, Tony, don't worry. We'll just do like an amp crash there, you know, drop a reverb tank or something. It'll be a big noise. It will distract everyone. Won't, no one will have any idea that we slow down there. He's like, okay, we'll try it. And I feel like a lot of production is fixing problems, you know, mm. and there were way more problems in the tape days than now, you know, because you know, there would just may be some mistake or that you, you may like accidentally record on the wrong track or erase something that may just all of a sudden be magic. You just never know. Mm. Man, that's, I love that. It's like being a magician. Look yeah. over here. <laughs> I know. That's exactly what, 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 what it's like, you know? Um, like, I feel like for Beatles stuff, you know, they would be bouncing down generation to generation and fidelity gets sort of lost and you're down to like the final mix and the drums are mixed with all these other things and you're losing the backbeat. So, Hey, let's overdub a tambourine. Mm -hmm. Why is the tambourine so fucking loud? Maybe it's <laughs> because it's the last thing and they were losing the backbeat. Maybe it wasn't this magical production trip. 
you know, I don't know. <laughs> I love it. Well, uh, what if you had to pick like, I don't know, a couple of records you would say are perfectly produced or, or your favorite productions that you often reference, what would they be? Hmm. Boy. Uh, I mean, off the top of my head, I would, I would probably say, um, I mean, a lot of Radiohead records, I, I wouldn't say I necessarily reference them a lot, but when I think about like production wise, I mean, I don't think you can get much better than like, okay, computer or in rainbows, you know, I feel like mm. those are pretty amazing records, you know? Um, uh, yeah. But then, I mean, I don't know, I like there's like, uh, you know, D'Angelo records and Kendrick Lamar records, I think that are produced that, that are like mind blowing to me, you know? Um, and uh, I tend to like listen to like, nowadays I'm listening a lot more to songs production, you know, trying mm -hmm. to get ideas that way. Um, so a lot of my full record productions tend to be like more old school kind of records, you know. Mm. So what do you um, what do you listen to most often? What's on your current playlist? Current playlist? Uh, let's see. Uh, the record I've been into a lot lately has been the latest uh, Low record. Have you heard that? No, I haven't, but I've heard about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it is, it is basically like um, <laughs> uh, if you've ever had an MRI, I don't know if you've ever had an MRI where you're in the little tube. There's like uh, all these grating noises and clicks and gears and everything. To me, it sounds like someone recorded what it's like to be in an MRI and then put these haunting vocals on top of it. So I don't know. The production is pretty crazy on that one. Um, I listen to that. I listen to like a lot of times I'll listen to... Um, uh, um, a lot of times I'll listen to, uh, like demos and things like that of, of bands I'm about to produce, you know, so I'll listen to a lot of that in my free time. And then I'll listen to uh, a station called KUTX here in Austin when I'm driving around and I get a lot of my new, new ideas, uh, or new bands from that, <clears throat> like a band called Geese, uh, and a band, a great band called Gustav out of New York City is probably my new favorite new band. Um, they're amazing. They sound like a band. Uh, I don't know if you've heard a band called ESG, a New York mm -hmm. band, uh, uh, all female band in, uh, pretty sure it was in the early seventies. Uh, and it's, it's great. Like early disco kind of stuff. Really, really great. Uh, ESG and Gustav sounds like, similar to that cool i forgot to ask this earlier but when you're on the road are you working on production for when you get off the road uh when i'm on the road um i tend to be like maybe listening to demos and like uh doing more of the uh like zoom pre-production calls things like that mm -hmm. um i usually don't like pull up uh ableton or anything like that um I use the other one thing I've been getting into on the road a little bit is a, a DAW called Renoise. Have you heard of that? No. What is that? It's a it's a it's a a DAW that is uh, was it, it's I forget what they call it, but it's like a piano ro roll DAW where you tend to have like loops like this in your DAW, and then it goes through X number of times and then drops to the next one. But mm. you can think about it as a um, uh, uh, a DAW used for those records like that Aphex Twin makes. I don't know if you've mm. ever listened to that type of music, but yeah. um, uh, that's another production style that I'm really fascinated with. To me, that kind of um, production feels like every single hi-hat hit has been tweaked. And then everything in the, the song has been tweaked a little bit. Mm. So this allows you that kind of granularity to create you know, insane kind of different things like that on a granular level. And I, 
Uh, so a DAW Reno is a, a play around with sometimes. Nice. Did that actually end up in productions or is that more of an experimental? Yeah, yeah I'm working with uh, an artist. She go by, goes by the name Heartwing, and I did all the rhythm section stuff in Renoise. Nice. Very cool. Well, we've come to the end of the hour. I have one more question I ask every guest. <laughs> what was your first snare drum? Oh, wow. My first snare drum? Uh, it was a Tama Art Star snare drum. Uh, let's see. I think it was a, yeah, 14 by five and a half. Yeah. Nice. And how long did you keep that? Or you still have it? I still have it. Yeah. Yep. Nice. Did it get used? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. yeah. It's not one of my go-to, but yeah, I still have it. Still sort of nostalgic for that. Nice. What is the art star? Is that maple? Birch? Yeah, it's maple. Yep. Maple. I don't know how many ply or anything. Yeah. All right. I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Jim Eno. Again, follow him, Jim Eno Acid, on Instagram to see what he's up to. Follow Spoon. Uh, go check out a Spoon Show. Dig into their discography if you haven't already. There's so many cool things to glean from their production style and just really cool songs. Follow Project Traction. Um, yeah. So now we're going to shift over into our shop talk section. This week, I'm checking out a quarter kit, which is the first time I've ever played one of these. It's a giant kit. So we're over at Hawthorne Drum Shop. Let's dig into it. Quarter drums. How do you even introduce this kit? This is... A quarter drum company from Huntsville, Alabama, but it's being repurposed as a Fibes kit. <laughs> what is happening here, Chris? <laughs> well, how you doing today, Mike? <laughs> what are these oddballs? So the tags say Fibes on the bass drum and some of the toms. But obviously, the bass drum head says Fibes. It's got a magic eight ball on it too, doesn't it? Is it a magic eight ball? <laughs> eyeball. Oh, eyeball. That's right. okay. <laughs> these say quarter. I have some knowledge of fibes drums and these remind me of fibes lugs so i would say it's a fibes kit but it's not what is it uh so this is a quarter kit uh 10 12 13 14 18 and 24 kick uh this is a chrome over wood kit they're they're actually jasper made shells oh are they mm -hmm. maple gum wood um this kit a guy got it from i guess his bandmate had bought it new back in the 80s. So this was, I figured he added the toms on, but he actually got all this together. There's probably, there's a snare you can't see behind there. I don't know if you can see it, but it's an eight by 14 snare It's a well. beast. This is such an 80s, quintessential 80s freaking monster. That sounds amazing. So that, that's actually not the exact snare that came with the kit. We sold that, but that's the, it's the same snare, just not the, oh, yeah. the exact one. But yeah. So old. this also has a Jasper shell. Mm -hmm. So Jasper is maple gum versus maple poplar, which would have been yeah. Keller. So Jasper, they're mainly known for like Gretsch. So, yeah, right. really, uh, I mean, <laughs> like I say this every show, really great sounding oh, drums. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you just did your demo of them. But I was the, really impressed. But the, so Fives was also Jasper shells. So essentially quarter bolt Fives. Is that Fibes what will use fiberglass shells. So the kind of the, his, the, the, the timeline was Fibes was in the 70s. And in the 1979, Jim Corder bought the rights or the machine, machinery or however you want to call it for, from Fibes and did Corder. So that's why all the Fibes lugs or all the lugs are Fibes. Um, mounts on here are Fibes. Spurs have the same kind of annoying like it's a telescoping spur, but there's a spring on the inside, and you got to twist it. Mm. Um, same kind of similar thing there. Same terrible <laughs> ball joint on there that like is not great. How do you even adjust that sucker? That's you can, weird. Just a nightmare. Um, so essentially, he bought fives and used Jasper shells. Oh, so there are no, there's no. Fibes wood shells prior to them being bought out again. I won't say that there are none, but Fibes is typically fiberglass. Uh, yeah, because I know the more recent version of Fibes was wood shells, Jasper yeah. shells, right? Yeah. Down in Austin. Is that yes. Right? So after the timeline, after Quarter, then there was Darwin. Darwin bought Quarter. <laughs> wow. And then at some point, I don't know the guy's name in Texas, Austin, bought Fibes. And so there's the Austin version of Fibes. 
But the OG fibes is, is actual fiberglass. Mm. Interesting. Fascinating. So quarter, man, it's like a weird, I mean, where would you put these in the timeline of American drums? This is the Early 80s. 80s. This is yeah. 80s. So this was trying to keep up with all the, the Japanese stuff at that point, right? Yamaha yeah. and Pearl and Tama. And everything in the 80s like was getting like big and heavy, which is cool because these are the kind of the classic depths. 14 on the, or 10 on the 14, 9 on the 13, 8 on the 12. I think the 10 is a 7 or 8. Looks a little deeper, yeah. Yeah. So you're not getting into like the 16 inch kicks at that point. So the, kind of the classic, which I like. I like the classic depths myself. But they are heavy, very heavy. They are beefy. Drums. So what is this metal? Is it just a piece of sheet metal wrapped around a drum? Yeah, it's just metal. Um, and you probably can't see it, but you know there's some corrosion and, and pinning all over the kit. To be but expected, right? a lot of th a lot of times, like metal wraps will dent easily. Mm. So there's not a whole lot of denting on here. But like if you're loading out of a gig and you smack into your cymbal or into your guitar player's face, <laughs> they're going to have a nose print in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, really cool kit. Pretty well taken wild. care of. We didn't have to really detail them at all. Um, but like you mentioned, there's there's fives badges on here, so you can't see it in the video. But there's an outline, I think, on the back side of the drums where you can see the original quarter badge. And fives badges were literally just stick on, mm. so you just stuck those on there. And you can see see if Martin these were Nazareth era tags, if you will. Interesting. Yeah. So that was a Pennsylvania brand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, not like super knowledgeable on like the timeline, but Fives did come out of Nazareth PA at some point. Wild. They are, they do use Jasper shells, which is like, a lot of people don't know. Cause you see like this big old chrome over wood kit and you think of like the six ply Ludwig chrome over wood kits, mm -hmm. which are equally heavy and they're fine. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, these were, these are good shells for sure. Um, hardware is good too, but they're, they're, they're good sounding drums. These are fun to play. I, they many... are, but that's the thing is they are fun. You know, normally if this wouldn't have been all born together, we would have probably pieced out the two toms separately, mm -hmm. but you know, it's all, it's a fun kit and it's, it's a thousand bucks for all, but six pieces. Yeah. It's pretty nuts. So, you know, you, you, we talk a lot about comparing modern prices. Like what does a thousand bucks get you in modern drums? Uh, mid-level and entry level kit. Yeah. Yeah. So you get a lot of drums for like not a lot of money, good shells. If you really, really wanted to, and frankly, we're a psychopath, you can rip the wrap off and rewrap them, stain them. <laughs> uh, we're not going to be responsible for any like severed fingers. I mean, honestly, I would just play one up, one down. And, yeah. And if it were me, it. I would probably forget the 10, 12, 13, put the 14 over there on, a, on just like a tom stand. Yeah. And then. Friggin' 24, 14, 18. Yeah, it's beefy. Yeah, those are my sizes. There you have it, episode 52. So if you enjoy the show, I ask you this every week. So if you don't mind, please head over to iTunes or YouTube, wherever you get your podcast or watch the show or listen to it. Drop us a review, five-star rating. It definitely helps get this show to rank higher in the listings so more drummers around the world can find it. So that's it. Go listen to some Spoon. Go try some quarter drums, and we'll see you next week.